we are going to look at George Washington as a young man. In 1753, George Washington is unknown and he is just 21 years old. However, within two years, by the time he is 23, his name will be on the lips of the most powerful kings in the world. Let's begin with some background. Successful French and British colonization of North America began essentially simultaneously in the early 17th century. The French established Quebec and moved down the St. Lawrence River Valley into the Great Lakes region, including the modern cities of Montreal and Detroit. In the 1750s, French Canada is populated with maybe 40,000 Frenchmen who are heavily integrated with local Native American communities in the fur trade. The British, on the other hand, are colonizing the east coast of the future United States, including the cities of Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Old Williamsburg. Sometimes we call these colonials English, and many of them are English, but it is more accurate to call them British because there are English, Scottish, Welsh, Scotch-Irish, and Irish here uh, as well, not to mention some Dutch, Swedish, and many Germans in Pennsylvania. In the 1750s, when George Washington is in his 20s, there are, believe it or not, over a million people in the British colonies. The intersection of French and British colonies had led to disputes and conflicts before the 1750s. Nova Scotia in Canada was a strategic point because it dominated the entrance into the St. Lawrence Valley. Many in the British government could see that the French stronghold at Louisbourg ensured French control of the St. Lawrence and hence the Great Lakes. Though outnumbered in North America, the French had established a wide-reaching water empire from the St. Lawrence through the Great Lakes. The highways in colonial times are the rivers. The Allegheny River flows south from the Great Lakes region into modern west, western Pennsylvania. The Monongahela in dark blue falls toward it, and the two rivers meet to form the Ohio River in white. The Ohio River in turn flows into the center of the continent, spilling into the Mississippi River. Thus, the forks of the Ohio, where the Ohio River begins, is the access ramp into the interior of the continent. Whoever controls access to the Ohio River controls the eastern half of the entire continent of North America. Needless to say, France and Britain are going to fight over the forks of the Ohio River. So the real estate of modern Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania was the cause of a world war between France and Britain in the 1750s. This conflict is called the French and Indian War or the Seven Years War. We will zoom in to get a better look at the disputed region. New France is up the northwest part of the map where the Great Lakes are, where Lake Erie is, and the British colonies in the 1750s extend to the foot of the Appalachian Mountains. So Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia essentially end where the Appalachian Mountains begin. Now the French and the British are not the only ones here, of course. The Iroquois in purple are dominating the Mohawk Valley in modern New York State all the way down through western Pennsylvania, and the Ohio River Valley has many powerful Algonquin nations, including the Miami and the Shawnee. In 1753, the French are expanding a system of forts south from Lake Erie toward the forks of the Ohio River. The French build Fort Presque Isle, followed by Fort Le Beau and Fort Machault at Venango, Pennsylvania, and they are closing in on the Ohio River. Governor Dinwiddie of Virginia, however, is also expanding British trade into the forks. Dinwiddie backs the Ohio Company, a British trading outfit that has a frontier post at Wills Creek. The British government has given Governor Dinwiddie power to confront force with force. Dinwiddie gives 21-year-old George Washington 
his first adventure. George Washington is to give notice to the French at Fort Le Beau that they are trespassing on British land. So in the fall of 1753, young George Washington leaves Alexandria, Virginia for Winchester, Virginia. He brings a French translator, the Dutchman Jacob von Braam. He then presses on to Wills Creek. Wills Creek, or modern-day Cumberland, Maryland, is, uh, from the British perspective, the last outpost of civilization before the frontier wilderness. At Wills Creek, Washington finds the Ohio Company frontier guide, Christopher Gist, who will now take him through the mountains and to the forks of the Ohio. George Washington is now on a very short list of English-speaking men who have gone over the Appalachian Mountains and seen the forks of the Ohio River. This is his map of the forks of the Ohio from his 1753 adventure. As I got down before the canoe, I spent some time in viewing the rivers and the land in the fork, which I think extremely well situated for a fort as it has the absolute command of both rivers. George Washington, November 22nd, 1753. It is now December 1753. Washington presses north from the forks deep into contested territory. He arrives at Venango, later fortified as Fort Machault. Washington has his first interaction with the French here and he is told that the French explorer La Salle discovered this territory 60 years previously, and the French have every right to the Ohio River. Finally, Washington makes it further north to Fort Le Beau and meets with the French officers. Washington gave the officers the letter from Governor Dinwiddie, which informed the French that the Ohio River territory is, quote, notoriously known to be the property of the crown of Great Britain. The French officers are polite, but they send off young Washington. However, before he leaves, Washington sketches the dimensions of the French fortifications. Washington's return trip to the forks is perilous. He is moving through the snow and bitter cold. At the forks he nearly dies twice. He is shot at by a stranger in the woods. We'll zoom in closer to what is now the modern metropolitan city of Pittsburgh, but then would have been Wooded Forest. And here, Washington is going to attempt to cross the Allegheny River, and it's December. It's very cold, and it's half frozen, and the waters are moving very rapidly. We have the Allegheny River here uh, highlighted in orange, and then there's this island here. This is Hare's Island. Then. When he attempts to cross the icy Allegheny, his raft capsizes. 21-year-old George Washington, future founder of the United States of America, spends a bitter late December night on Hare's Island, trying not to freeze to death. Today, Hare's Island is appropriately called Washington's Landing. In April of 1754, George Washington sets out again for the forks of the Ohio. Everything being ready, we began our march according to our orders, the 2nd of April, with two companies of foot commanded by Captain Peter Hogg and Lieutenant Jacob von Braam. George Washington is back at Wills Creek. Washington, now 22 in the spring of 1754, is experienced in the backcountry, and Dinwiddie has given him the commission of lieutenant colonel. Washington is to bring some 200 men to the forks of the Ohio, improve the road as they go, and assist the construction of a fortification there. The Ohio Company is already at the forks building a fortification. But Washington has several issues. First, his men are continuously grumbling about pay. His militiamen are paid a fraction of a common laborer. Secondly, supplies are not arriving on time. Wagons are hard going over the mountains. And much more ominously, Washington has just learned 
that the men he is to support at the forks have been driven out by the French. Captain Trent's ensign, Mr. Ward, has this day arrived from the fork of the Ohio and brings the disagreeable account that the fort, on the 17th instant, was surrendered at the summons of Monsieur Contracourt to a body of French, consisting upwards of 1,000 men. Washington is now at a critical point. Knowing that his men may desert at any time, knowing that supplies are slow coming, knowing that the French now control the forks of the Ohio, knowing that Native American nations all along the Great Lakes are reinforcing the French, knowing that he may be outnumbered ten to one, but George Washington decides to press on. Washington follows an old Native American trail called Nemacolin's Trail through the mountains, bringing his ragtag militia to a clearing in the forest that the British call the Great Meadows. Washington makes a camp here in a place he refers to as a charming field. We will zoom in to get a closer look at Washington's camp in the Great Meadows. Washington is now between ridges in the Appalachian Mountains. Behind him is Wills Creek, and to the northwest is Red Stone, a frontier post built by the Ohio Company. The path that Washington is widening and improving between Wills Creek and Redstone is modern Route US 40. He has one more major ridge to cross to get over the mountains, but if Washington can make it to Redstone, he will be at the Monongahela River, highlighted here in blue. The Monongahela will lead directly to the forks of the Ohio River. Redstone today is modern Brownsville, Pennsylvania. However, Washington is informed that he is not alone. His Seneca Iroquois ally, Tenagrasen, informs him that an encampment of French are in, the high, are in the high ground just a few miles northwest. Fearing he is going to be ambushed, Washington moves 40 men through the night into the wooded slopes toward the French camp. It's dark and raining. Then on the morning of May 28, 1754, George Washington has his first fight. It's a 15-minute skirmish that will be discussed in London and Paris. It will have reverberations across the world and be the spark of a global contest between France and Britain for North America. We will zoom further. Today this area is forested as it would have been in 1754, though the trees would have been much wider than today because it was an old growth forest in 1754. If we take away the trees, we can see the topography. Notice the steep slopes. This terrain has rocky ledges. If we zoom in further, we can see how Washington's men in red surprised the French in blue who were in the glen. Washington has men on rocky slope above the French as well as flanking them to the south. What follows is subject to dispute. We do know that muskets go off. A skirmish ensues. The French try to escape, but Washington's Native American fighters trap them. In a short skirmish, the French have 12 men killed and 21 taken prisoner. The British have only one man lost. It's very one-sided. Some suspect French were killed after the firing stops, but nobody really knows. What is known is that one of the dead is Monsieur de Jumonville, an official diplomat of the King of France. Washington will spend much ink justifying his action at what becomes known as Jumonville's Glen. He claims that no diplomat would camp in secret in the vicinity of foreign troops Washington knows the French may counterattack. He goes back to the Great Meadows and builds a small palisaded fort. This is Fort Necessity. Reinforcements arrive, including regular soldiers under Captain James McKay. With 300 men, Washington decides to press forward toward the forks. However, near Redstone, Washington's native scouts inform him that the French are coming. 
Washington makes a hurried retreat back to Fort Necessity at the Great Meadows. Let's zoom in to get a better look at Fort Necessity. Washington's fort is set at the junction of two streams. The fort itself is very small, comprised of earthwork mounds, a wooden palisade, and a storehouse. The trail you see in purple is a modern National Park Service trail. 100 of Washington's 400 men are sick, so 300 men ready themselves behind the earthworks. A French, Canadian, and Native American force under De Villiers appears from the northwest. Washington moves his men into the open, ready to fight a traditional European-style battle. However, the French and Native Americans have no interest in fighting a European battle. They move within the trees around the fort. Washington realizes what's happening and hurries his men back into the fort. The French and Native Americans take cover in the trees, firing from the forest. Washington's men hunker behind the trenches. It starts to rain. British muskets become useless in the constant rain. The French and Native Americans, with powder kept dry under the tree canopy, keep a steady firing position for hours. Washington's men believe they are about to be massacred, and they break open the fort's storehouse and get drunk on rum. Then, as the sun begins to set, the French call for parley. The British are lucky. De Villiers is willing to let the British go if they promise to never return. Washington signs surrender terms that, in French, acknowledge he assassinated the diplomat Jumonville. Washington's first battle is a disaster. One-fourth of his men were sick and one-fourth were killed or wounded. The French and Indians had lost only three in a full day of fighting. The next day, Washington retreats from Fort Necessity. It is the 4th of July, 1754. The British government is alarmed by the seizure of the Forks of the Ohio by France. A major counterstrike is planned for 1755. In the south, the British under General Braddock will set out to take Fort Duquesne. Farther north, in Albany, New York, a strike will be made against the French at Fort Niagara, and a second strike from Albany will hit the French on Lake Champlain. Finally, New Englanders are to hit the French strongholds in Nova Scotia. It's a plan so ambitious it's doomed to failure. Washington, now 23, will serve as General Braddock's aide-de-camp. It is Washington's third trip to the Forks in so many years. His mission is to take Fort Duquesne from the French. The British mean business. General Braddock is a stern professional soldier who commands professional redcoats. 3,000 soldiers, cannons, wagons, engineers, and road laborers will set out against Fort Duquesne. Washington originally believes the French and Native Americans will be overwhelmed by simultaneous attacks across New France, but his opinion begins to change by the time the British are in Wills Creek. Reports are arriving that Native Americans are mobilizing in large numbers to defend Fort Duquesne. The army is making very slow progress through the mountains. The train of wagons and cannons progresses only a few miles each day. Braddock divides his army in two, sending 1,500 men in an advanced flying column in an effort to speed the advance on Fort Duquesne. By early July, the British are in striking distance of Fort Duquesne. Let's zoom in to the forks. In yellow is the Allegheny River, in purple the Monongahela River, and in red is the Ohio River. Fort Duquesne is right at the forks of the rivers. Braddock and his aide Washington are now only ten and a half miles from their target. Washington has suffered fevers for days, but he is committed to the cause and stays at the general's side. The army will cross the Monongahela two times, making landfall just above Turtle Creek. 
This region of modern-day Pittsburgh is appropriately called Braddock Pittsburgh. Let's zoom in for a closer look. We can see the modern streets of Braddock Pittsburgh. In 1755, this area would be old-growth oak forests, but now it is urban Pittsburgh. The topography is critical because it will cause a trap for the British. To the south and west is the Monongahela River in blue, to the south and east is Turtle Creek. And if we examine a topographical map, we can see to the east of Braddock's landing site, it is all high ground. Braddock's army is moving through low ground near the river and they will be exposed on the right by wooded heights. It is July 9, 1755. Braddock's army is just crossing the Monongahela River. They are moving in a thin column following a Native American path. Indian guides are at the front followed by a young officer named Thomas Gage who has about 350 men. Behind him is another young officer, Horatio Gates, whose men are guarding the road crews. So in Braddock's army we have Thomas Gage, Horatio Gates, and George Washington, three young officers who will all play pivotal roles in the American Revolution. In a few decades, Washington and Gates will lead rebel forces against Britain, while Thomas Gage will, will remain loyal to the crown. But today, all three men are on the same side. The British have flankers, here in yellow, who are watching the flanks. This isn't redcoats blindly going through the woods. They are taking regular precautions. St. Clair follows with some 250 laborers who are widening the road for wagons and cannons. Next is Braddock and Washington with the main body, some 500 men. These men are moving in thin columns on either side of the road, protecting the wagons and cannons in yellow. A rear guard of some 100 militiamen cover the rear. Braddock's army stretches at least a mile long. Remember, they are following an old Native American path, so the road is very narrow, hence the work crews to widen it for wagons. The narrowness of the road will be a significant factor in the battle. The guides spot enemy approaching. Muskets fire. The British are now under attack by Ojibwa, Ottawa, Shawnee, and other Great Lake nations, as well as French Canadians. Gage moves forward. The Redcoats form into line on the narrow road. Their enemy, however, takes to the woods, disappearing within the trees. Braddock hears the gunfire and moves forward. Gage at front is under heavy fire. The Redcoats send volleys into the forest. Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Shawnee are invisible in the trees. Both flanks are being struck simultaneously. As Gage begins to withdraw, his men jam up against Braddock's advancing column. The narrow road leads to a traffic jam of men. British officers, wearing large hats, on horses, and decked with medals, are quickly dropped by Native American marksmen. Some two-thirds of the British officers are killed. The command structure breaks down. The laborers and wagoners rush back toward the river. The Redcoats' discipline becomes their own worst enemy. Untrained or undisciplined troops would have routed, but these are professional British Redcoats. They are trained to hold their ground. They bunch up on the narrow road in formation, firing at a shadow enemy that is hitting them from all sides. Washington asks the general if he can secure high ground to the right. Braddock is unsure, then the general is hit. Washington gets Braddock on a wagon. After three hours of standing their ground, fruitlessly, against a shadow enemy that they could not even see in the forest, the Redcoats run back to the Monongahela. 1,000 British, or two in three, are killed or wounded. The Native Americans and French Canadians have only a few dozen casualties. It's a total disaster. Washington has narrowly survived yet another disaster. News of Washington's miraculous survival 
spreads throughout the British colonies. He writes back home, As I have heard since my arrival at this place, a circumstantial account of my death and dying speech, I take this early opportunity of contradicting both and of assuring you that I now exist and appear in the land of the living by the miraculous care of Providence that protected me beyond all human expectation. I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot under me and yet escaped unhurt. In 1758, 26-year-old George Washington will finally take part in the successful capture of Fort Duquesne. British General Forbes has planned a new route through Pennsylvania, beginning at the frontier town of Carlisle. The new route cuts through the modern Pennsylvania towns of Loudoun, Bedford, and Ligonier. On November 28, 1758, almost five years to the week when Washington first went to the Forks, the French abandoned Fort Duquesne in front of the British Army. The British rebuild a fort at the Forks of the Ohio. The British name it after William Pitt, the statesman strategist from Britain. Fort Pitt will become Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. By the time George Washington was 26 years old, he was an experienced frontiersman, a builder of two highways, a battle-hardened soldier, a survivalist, a surveyor, and an officer. The worthy coming of age of a man who would start a new nation.